Hey everyone, welcome to week seven of Advanced Econometrics. This week we're talking about how to actually estimate the logit model, not using uh, our functions, but how to actually uh, code it up ourselves using maximum likelihood estimation. So uh, that's gonna pick up right where we left off last week with maximum likelihood estimation. We're just gonna take, take what we learned last week and apply it to the logit model here. We're gonna start by uh, recapping the logit model a little bit, just so it's fresh in all of our minds. Then we're gonna talk about how to estimate the logit model using maximum likelihood. And then finally, we're gonna talk about a few kind of alternate estimation methods or uh, uh, kind of estimation frameworks that we could use to, to estimate a logit model. We're not gonna go into details on those today, but just wanna point them out to you. And this week, all the material uh, coincides with chapters 3.7 and 3.8 in the train textbook. So make sure to take a look at those uh, before you keep going with these videos. All right, let's quickly recap the logit model uh, and really everything we've talked about so far in this course. So we started off talking about structural econometric models. Then we laid out the discrete choice framework for thinking about this kind of unique class of problems where people are choosing among discrete alternatives. Then we laid out the random utility model as kind of the base on which we're going to build all of our econometric models. And then we talked specifically about the logit model. Then we took a slight diversion and instead of talking about econometric models, we started talking about kind of econometric estimation methods and talked about maximum likelihood estimation and numerical optimization that we're going to use in order to find the maximum likelihood estimator. So today we're finally going to put all of these pieces together and estimate a structural econometric model ourselves. Uh, not using R as canned routines, but learning how to actually do it ourselves. But first I want to do, like I said, a quick recap of both the random utility model and the logit model more specifically. So the setup here is that a decision maker, uh, which we can call N, is facing a choice among capital J discrete alternatives. This is just kind of generally called a discrete choice problem. And the random utility model says that a decision maker is going to choose the alternative that maximizes their utility. So every one of these alternatives provides some utility and the decision maker chooses an alternative if and only if that alternative provides the decision maker more utility than every other alternative. If we could see utility, if that was something we could observe in a data set, this would be an easy problem to analyze, but we don't observe a utility. And so what we want to do is, as econometricians, is to model utility as being composed of two components. The first we call representative utility and represent it by the capital V. And this is the utility that we can model from observed attributes, the things that we actually see in the data. We can construct some portion of utility that comes from those things. Then the remainder is going to be this epsilon term, which is the extra utility from unobserved attributes or that the, the, the utility that we do not put into our model explicitly. And we're going to treat that as random. And then the total utility is just the sum of these two. It's the sum of the, the utility from the observed attributes that we can actually model plus these unobserved random utility draws. And so then we wrote down this, this description of, of a choice probability. Choice probabilities are important because ultimately those are what we're going to use to solve for our parameters, trying to set, uh, set those parameters such that our, our choice probabilities are kind of as close as possible to the actual observed choices. So in this general framework, the choice probability for Ni, that is the probability that decision maker N chooses alternative I, is... Uh, is the probability that the utility from I is greater than the utility from all other alternatives. And we don't know that this with certainty. We can't say that it's 100% certain it's going to be more because there's this random component. And that's why we're talking about probabilities here. Uh, we went through and we, we showed that we could kind of reframe this, uh, this problem, uh, breaking it down into the epsilon terms and the representative utility terms. But we end up with this really kind of complicated multi-dimensional integral that we have to solve in order to uh, in order to get choice probabilities. 
and importantly, we're going to have to make some assumptions about this term right here. This is the joint density of all of the epsilon draws for a given individual. So how are all of those unobserved utilities, which we treat as random for an individual, how are all of those jointly distributed? We need to make an assumption or know something about that. So the first uh, kind of ran, uh, model that we talked about building off of this discrete choice and random utility framework is the logit model. And the logit model made a simple and sometimes maybe often overly strong assumption about that joint density that I just described. In the logit model, we assume that every one of those epsilons is IID type one extreme value with variance equal to pi squared divided by six. And I just wanna highlight really the key piece of this is that they are IID. The amount of unobserved utility that a decision maker gets from any alternative is unrelated to the amount of, uh, the amount of utility that they get, uh, unobserved utility that they get from any other alternative. They are completely independent from one another. And in a lot of cases, that's just not going to be true. Uh, we're gonna be able to group uh, maybe group alternatives into in, into groups in a way that, that, that there might be some obvious preference for one group versus another among certain people. But the reason we make this assumption is because it yields a closed form expression for choice probabilities. Instead of that complicated multidimensional integral on the last slide, with the logit assumption in place, we can represent choice probabilities using this nice, simple expression. If I gave you uh, representative utilities here, you could very easily calculate these choice probabilities, whereas uh, that's not the case with that multidimensional integral on the last slide. So th this is going to make solving our, our problem, uh, so solving for our parameters really easy using these choice probabilities. Um, the unfortunate part here is that these choice probabilities and really the assumption of the of the logit model implies some some rigid and often unrealistic substitution patterns. Uh, this kind of proportional substitution that we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, as well as as the the independence of a relative event alternatives being in place, which uh, uh, these kind of properties are likely not to hold in a lot of real empirical settings. And so there is a trade off here by assuming uh, by making the logit assumption and getting these simple choice probabilities, uh, we're kind of imposing some, some additional rigidity on, on how, uh, how choices are being made. Okay, that's it for the recap. On the next video, we are going to dive into actually estimating a logit model using maximum likelihood estimation.